So as the typical format, and then we go through the update and the main session with Mehdi from the Turks and talking about how they build the product on the top of the Azure services and what their product does in terms of accelerating your journey to cloud native. So I leave the details to Mehdi for that. Uh, there are some upcoming events here. Uh, Expert Live Australia is happening on 19 and 20 of the September. So there are a bunch of cool speakers from the community, from Microsoft, and uh, some really experts doing some uh, sessions. In, uh, it's a two days, so you can. The agenda is published, so you can go and check the agenda. And there are pretty much. They, they, they cover all aspects of the platform. There are technical sessions, there are like the leadership sessions, business sessions, and, and, and they're trying to cover the even cost optimization and architectural session. A different area is covered. There are something in there. I believe they run it in these multiple tracks. There are multiple yeah. rooms. So yeah, so yes, they are not. Sure. Yes, yeah, so, all right. Yeah. One of the speakers. How do you go? Uh, Steve, so for Express Live, what we're looking at is an event around not just Azure, but also how we do system management, device management, cloud, dev, and everything associated. So the event's going to be hosted at the uh, North Sydney Dennis office, and there's going to be four or five rooms where you're going to be able to drop into a session that you want to go into. Uh, the cost is $100, 100 and something dollars uh, for a two-day event, so pretty good value. Uh, you're going to have people coming from internationally come and speak, as well as a whole different local presenters talking about technology. So, highly recommend it. it's going to be a lot of fun. Thanks. Thanks to Steve. Yep. And as a community advocate, so I think that's a fantastic opportunity for networking as well. So, there will be constructive ways that you can meet and get a good networking session from, the, from that perspective. And Microsoft Reactor sessions, so that's a uh, they still keep running all the sessions. Uh, pretty much, there is an event on. Uh, there is a live event every day organized by Microsoft Reactor, not just the Sydney, but uh, the link is for the Sydney. And their YouTube channel is also available for all the previous year for the session that you can go and check. Uh, but check them out, and yeah, if, uh, definitely you can find some relevant session to the area or to the vertical that you are involved and in working with that. Yeah, so Azure News. Now let's talk about the Azure News. So the first part which was to focus on the AI, or AI everywhere. So I uh, maybe there are for that. Yeah, yeah thanks. Thank you. Um, okay. Who has heard of Model Catalog? Azure. Uh, yeah, I figured that. I have just written it. <laughs> I'll explain about it. So, Modern Catalog is the in Azure Machine Learning Studio. We have got something called Modern Catalog now. So, you have got a catalog of all the open source models, which means that you have got the access to the models like Meta, Solana, and Falcon, and all the models from Hugging Face as well. So, whoever is working around that space can access within Azure rather than access from outside world or your enterprise applications. That would give you a security layer as well, um, in addition to the usual subscription standard security standards. So that's why I think I'm just included this. Um, there was a product called Azure Form Recognizer. Um, if anybody has heard about it, that used to just take the receipts from your calls and translate it into the OCR um, JSON object, but what they have done, they have not just renamed it to the document intelligence, but they have improved so many other things. They have included so many uh, features as well as they have improved that part of uh, OCR. So now you can have contracts in multiple languages within one document translated with the appropriate format within to your target document. So, and they have got like batches of documents as well. Like the support for the bags, I have used it myself. This is what I was telling this to Sam. I was running a demo yesterday, and it surprisingly worked well. Um, it was it was released 
as GA this month, this month or last month. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Um, this one or last one. So, um, for a GA tech of this capability, I'm, I'm, I was surprised. Um, function calling. So, Azure Open AI. If anybody has got an access to the Azure Open AI, if you don't have it, they are now proving it super fast. So you can apply for it. Um, they have got function like Azure Open AI has got a function calling support now. Um, for those who don't know what function calling is, function calling is like you don't have to you don't have to parse your own JSON object like one by one. If you are building some booking bot, let's say with Open AI, uh, what you can do is you can have a complex query written for yourself um, or for your customer, and you can parse it using function calling. So let's say, just saying, as an example, I want to book a hotel at a specific location if the weather is blah. So if these kind of scenario, in these kind of scenarios, you are calling a weather service, you are calling a hotel service, and you are calling, let's say, a math service. So you can have those services built in, not built in, you can have those services um, returned back to you through function calling. This is super cool. Um, Azure AI text-to-speech has now got 40 new languages, which means now 70 languages in total. Um, they also have got 173, I think, neural voices uh, support. So you can also apply for the custom neural voice. We are also approving it, just as that. Um, which means that you can now train your own voice to work as Azure text-to-speech. It sounds scary, but yes, it is true. Um, Azure Open AI, use your own data. So if anybody is, so what Microsoft has done, unfortunately, um, that bot service, there was a, there is a service called bot service, and there was a product called bot framework composer. Um, it was very dear to my heart. That's why I'm saying that sadly. Um, that has been stopped in providing any new features. So they have introduced all the capabilities of Bot Framework Composer to Power Virtual Agent, which is a part of Power Platform family, super expensive stuff, if you want to use it for yourself. So uh, you can deploy Azure OpenAI Bot directly to your Power Virtual Agent now, which is super cool and very seamless as well. Um, however, it comes with a cost, additional cost, whereas Bot Framework Composer was free. Um, Azure Cognitive Search with Langchain. So Langchain is the framework which is used to build complex generative AI scenarios. Let's say you are building the bot which I was talking to you about, some complex capabilities in your solution. Langchain is used for that. It is a Python variant of semantic kernel, or you can say semantic kernel is a C-sharp variant of Langchain. If you are working with for Microsoft Partner, and you are using any of the AI services, you are definitely eligible to get rewards from Microsoft uh, in terms of Azure credits, in terms of some financial benefits, if you provide them feedback. So, or in all of these services? Yes. Just open AI? No, all of these services. Anything that comes under the umbrella of AI. Azure AI. Yeah, Azure AI. Anything AI. Yes. Uh, in your partner center, you will see this as well, but there is a specific web page uh, or link I can provide you that um, where you have to provide this feedback. Over to Sam. Yep, so there are a bunch of updates happening across the platform. So there are a few related to mostly active space, which uh, Simon will talk about that one. But there are a few mostly related to the cloud native one, apart from the first one in the preview, which is a cool one in Azure networking. And basically, uh, there is a new feature coming in preview, which enables uh, fellow logs in your virtual networks. And it's, if you're familiar with Azure Networking and use it or uh, logging for, uh, in that space, you must be familiar with the NSG logs. This VNet fellow logs is NSG logs, but extended with more capabilities to the NSG logs. And basically what it does is it's, uh, it captures all the IP traffic flow within your virtual networks. 
and uh, store them in a storage account, which then you can use that with any like the any sim choice of yours, or you can use it with different. You can forward it to the Splunk or anywhere for visualization. And it has more details in terms of the uh, networking flow, what's happening in your virtual network, for example, application to application, subnet to subnet, and all, all those flows will be captured. It's part of the network watcher, which you can go and enable. Uh, but uh, it's overlapping the NSG logs. So NSG logs are still there. Probably I'm guessing until this goes GA and maybe they get rid of the NSG logs and add the remaining capabilities into the virtual network as well. But uh, it's good so you can use it for security purposes, for analysis services uh, purposes, or even you can use it for governance and compliance, for example, in the government agencies or in the big enterprises, relying heavily on the compliance. Uh, another cool feature coming in preview is the application gateway for containers. It's, it's a new service, a member of application gateway, but it's a new SKU in that family. New SKU means it's a combined and basic Microsoft bundle two products for you, which is a load balancer version of the application gateway, plus application gateway for ingress control, if you're familiar with that and ever deployed within your Kubernetes. So it's a bundle of these two services. Now you get it as a separate SKU, comes as a separate pricing. And basically you don't need to deal with any of those separately, and you can define all the uh, configuration, for example, for updating the application gateway in terms of the number of pods as a backend and everything within the Kubernetes itself, which you used to do it separately for the ingress controller. And also it comes with a couple of supporting features, for example, rather than the ingress, it also supports the gateway API within the Kubernetes, which you cannot do that with any other ingress controller or any, with the application gateway ingress controller. So it's it's pretty cool. So it's in preview, which you can start using. It's I think it is still a buggy, but yeah, it's that's the purpose of the preview. For example, you, you deploy it and you can never delete it because there is a race condition between the delete and all the resources. When you want to delete between the application gateway and object within the Kubernetes. But it's, it's good, so pricing is less unknown, but the good thing is that we're in Australia is that way, so you can go and give it a try, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, it also uh, added a bunch of scalability and performance with application gateway ingress, for example, in terms of the number of pod limits, so it's increased to 1400. In terms of the performance, how fast it can update the application gateway when your pods are scaled up and scaled down. So it's, it's not comparable with that application separately. Uh, it's very improved. Uh, new monitoring and logging updates. There are a bunch of monitoring and logging updates in the Azure Firewall. Uh, there are three of them, which uh, there are four or five of them, but three of them very important. One of them is related to the resource health. So it's uh, added to the Azure Resource Health service, and basically you can use the Azure Resource Health uh, for getting all the service interruption updates and everything, and make sure your Azure Firewall is always healthy, and for at least proactively get all the notification if there is anything coming up to that service. It's integrated into that one. Another cool one is you get a, a workbook, so you get the Azure Firewall work workbook which visualizes all your Azure Firewall behavior, activities, and events, and everything. And you can see, for example, how your application rules, your networking rules are performing, which rule is at, sitting at the top, which rule, hit, which rule hitting the most, which application. And all those visualization comes as part of this workbook. So if, if you work with Azure Firewall, definitely deploy it and give it a try. So there are cool updates as part of that. Uh, and another one is uh, the structured logging added to the Azure Firewall. And uh, before this update, Azure Firewall used a simple logging goes to the uh, log analytics, so as a simple entry log. But they introduced the structured logging. So if you are if you are a developer, you must be familiar with the structured logging how it works. 
So it then has layer on the existing logging and it captures more details from the, all the networking event and all the firewall events happening and it improves, it adds improvements to, for example, when you want to query all those logs and basically come up with the advanced queries or more complex queries to see what's happening across the uh, Azure firewall. So it's in terms of the performance and speed, there is improvement as well compared to the simple and three logs. So uh, definitely rewards to give it a try and uh, make sure your actual firewall is operated to use this uh, feature as well. Bunch of uh, features in the GA space. Uh, 1.27 Kubernetes now it's supported by APS and that's a big minus. So that's a big update for the APS. Uh, because 1.27 itself in the Kubernetes is a huge update. So there is more than 50 features, more than 70 enhancement improvements coming as part of this. But from the Azure perspective, it's very important because if you upgrade to 1.27, you can enter into the long-term service which Microsoft provides. And from that point, uh, you don't need to worry about upgrading or anything happening to your cluster. So from that perspective, it's uh, pretty cool because that LTS is GA now, 1.27 is GA, and basically enables all the Azure clients to go and enter into the long-term service. Uh, which is a two years uh, unconditional support from Microsoft when you enter into that long-term service support. Uh, upgrade enhancement with event periods is another capability. Uh, it exists in uh, AKS, but it's improved with uh, more events uh, added to the, uh, to the feature. And basically, you can now get all the events from the cluster upgrades and handle them with the event grid. So previously it was just, for example, if there is a new version available for your cluster, you could get the event and you could proactively think about upgrading your cluster. But they added a bunch of other uh, new events, for example, up upgrade started, upgrade failed, upgrade canceled, or uh, if there is a new feature, uh, a new version available for your cluster, and uh, those bunch of, uh, uh, there is, a, I think, seven, eight already event type that AKS emits, and you can handle them with the event grid at the moment. AKS private link service integration is important as well. It, again, it exists, but this feature simplifies that in terms of auto creation of the TLS and uh, private service link for you through the, uh, through the annotation in your service. So currently, if you want to enable the PLS for your ATS and make all the communication with the ATS private, so you need to grab all the uh, load balancer, internal load balancer from the cluster. And for example, you need the private IP, you need all the details, and then you need to go to the portal, click up way, create a private link service, enter the private IP of the private load balancer of the AKS, and you need to do all that uh, uh, manually. And, but with this feature, you just specify the annotations for your services, and with the load balancer service annotation for your, uh, for your objects. And what it does is it automatically creates the PLS in the Azure environment for you with all the IPs and even if the IP gets updated because all the annotation and all the objects are there, it automatically updates the PLS as well within the Azure environment. From that perspective, it's, it, it's a pretty cool feature and simplifies a bunch of uh, automation and provisioning work for you. Yeah. Azure Container Apps got a couple of updates, uh, as you can see on the screen. The key vault integration uh, is now available in its GA, which basically means you can reference from the secrets from the key vault, and it automatically creates a secret in the container apps for you. Uh, also, you can uh, mount all the secrets as a body room into your container apps. And what that means is, uh, in addition to referencing to the environment variables for the secrets in your container, you can mount them as a file in the web volume and your application can use them as a file rather than the environment variables. 
session affinity in, if you're familiar with the web application and definitely it's not a new thing but it's now available in the container apps and basically it's for a stateful application so if you have a stateful application and you want to make sure all the uh, following requests are handled by the same container which uh, did the first request so you can enable the session affinity and it makes sure that uh, on Basically, in the first response back, it creates a cookie and it uses that cookie for all the following um, requests to make sure they, they, they get served by the same container. Yeah. And course support is also added. So, if your application requires a course functionality, so it's not available and you can enable by specifying a bunch of uh, origins in, in your container apps and um, within the browser so you can make any request to any of those and the container apps now supports that. Another update is which uh, which been in preview for quite a long time is the cost optimization for the um, Azure monitor for container insights. It's now GA and basically if you work with the containers and specifically if you are running a huge Workload in terms of the cluster, in terms of the pods and everything, you end up paying a lot for the Azure Monitor container inside unless you go and disable all the unwanted logs and everything. Because there are a bunch of tables, for example, inventory, logs, performance metrics, and everything that get injected into the log analytics and it gets ingested. And for all of them, you have to pay money. And because of that, this Container insights become a very costly solution. Now with this GA, there are a bunch of features. Not all of the features, for example, going with the schema V2, it's a selling preview. But what this feature gives you is it enables you to select which tables of the uh, container insight you want to get ingested. For example, if you don't want the performance table, so you can exclude the performance table. And basically, you can do the optimization at the table level. And uh, even you can specify interval, for example, rather than the one minute, you can increase it to between one to 30 minutes to how long, based on that interval, you want all those logs get ingested into the log analytics worker space. And uh, another one basically is, it, 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 it enables you to exclude the namespaces. For example, if you want to exclude some namespaces from a specific table, so you can do that by this one. It's GA and it helps a lot in terms of optimizing the cost that you are paying for the uh, container inside solution within your Azure Monitor. The last one is not related to the Azure platform, but that's a new update came two days ago. So from 22nd of the August, Microsoft started to update all the certification, all the role-based certification, and expect to some updates from all the sets. And they are, they are also working to improve the experience for all the, all, for everyone that sits for the exam. And one of them, one of the improvements is basically all the certificate goes open book. What that means is, when you sit for the exam, you are allowed to open Microsoft Lair and anywhere you go. So, yeah, so that's a big thing. So, basically, you open, um, I think I had the. Um, don't know why. So here is the update, for example. So with this one, is you are allowed. So basically, this is the certification screen as the typical one. For example, you see this button will be added at the bottom at the at the bottom of the screen. And if, when you hit that one, it automatically opens the entire Microsoft layer for you. And that's why it goes, it goes open book because you have access to anything you want in the Microsoft lab. Definitely, it's not recommended. I encourage to read this article, but not for answering every single question, <laughs> because there are a couple of things attached to this one. For example, 
it doesn't extend your time when you go to Microsoft then. So it's this still consuming from your certification time. And especially for the scenario-based question, it's not useful because you need to focus on the scenario and everything. But there are, in, uh, basically that's, that, that's in line with improving the experience for anyone that sits for exam and, and maybe they just want to, they, they just need a quick refresher or anything. But for example, if you try to go to GitHub, so you get the access denied at the top. So anything within the Microsoft Learn and with that domain, you are allowed to navigate and you, you are allowed to use it in the during the certificate exam. So, so, so that's a big one. Is there a referencing for us to get out of the reference and you're not going to be able to access it? No. No. <laughs> I don't see any problems with this. Yeah, I think, I think, I don't know, I think there's like, well, like you docs need to learn, right? So I bet they wish they hadn't done that because then they can just send people to the docs instead of yeah. Microsoft Learn. Anyway, um, I just have this end here after you guys have spoken because I always feel like I didn't put enough uh, on here. Um, my PC yet, yeah. you don't have the pizza. Uh, they are coming. Oh, I don't know. Maybe they're sitting out there. I don't know. Just trying to look through the door. Let's see. If they are, they're probably pretty cold by now. No? Not yet? All right. Um, I tried to distract you for a moment on how short my list is, but um, I didn't succeed, clearly. Uh, quick ones from me. Um, last month, I spoke about uh, how Azure Advisor had added. Uh, retirements as a workbook because that's kind of the pain point for a lot of people is they oftentimes miss retirements of services in Azure. Not that Azure retires a lot of stuff, but they often do retire features and capabilities or versions of APIs um, that are a couple of years old. And if you miss some of those things, sometimes it can jump up and bite you. Uh, typically at just the wrong moment as well when you've got a production go live or a, a major event happening. Um, so they launched the retirements workbook so you can go and find out about what retirements uh, affect your services. So the workbook is not just a generic, here's all the retirements, it's the retirements that apply to your, uh, your particular environment. And they've added to that by launching a cost optimization workbook uh, because let's face it, everybody wants to save money in the cloud these days. Yeah. No? Stephen's, Stephen's shaking his head, no? Please don't. Spend more money in the cloud, you're saying? Okay. Well, um, if you'd like to go against that advice, um, the advisor cost optimization workbook is available to you. Go and uh, look at it in your um, Azure environment today. Next one's an interesting one. Uh, I actually need to go and look this up like Azure Boost. It's like the Boost Juice sign an agreement with Azure or something. It's going to be like a juice bar or something like that. But it um, turns out that's not the case. Uh, this is actually a pretty neat bit of tech. It is taking uh, what used to be in software only, the hypervisor. Uh, and it's starting to bake it into hardware uh, that's dedicated to being a hypervisor. So rather than installing a hypervisor on generic compute and services like we've done traditionally, Microsoft is now uh, building dedicated hardware uh, and specialized software to perform that hypervisor capability inside Azure. And the benefit is that it removes a bunch of layers between uh, your application and your OS and the underlying infrastructure, which means you get some pretty uh, amazing performance boosts. So I have to look these up because I can tell you I wouldn't remember them. So let's see if I can convince it to open. Uh, and I'm not a networking person or a performance person, but um, I do think their numbers are pretty impressive. So you can get 200 gigs of uh, network throughput. So 200 gigabit per second networking throughput, which is uh, not shaky to say the least. Um, and remote storage throughput of up to 10 gigabits per second and 400,000 IOPS, uh, which is um, fast storage workloads available today. Now, I'm not sure whether that's in Azure or the whole of the cloud, um, but let's just go with Azure for that. But um, that's in a limited preview at the moment, and you've got to choose some very specific um, VM SKUs to get your hands on it. Um, I'm not sure that it's actually available in Australia, I doubt it. But keep an eye on that because that might be a way to boost uh, your traditional VM workflows, and I suspect it'll probably come to the entire fleet of Azure eventually, because Azure is built on Azure, um, as we all know. API management added OData API support. Uh, OData API support seems a bit odd that it hasn't been there before now, uh, given how old OData is. But uh, API management is kind of one of the core components of what's loosely called the Azure Integration Services Suite. 
So you've got logic apps, uh, API management, Azure Functions, um, Service Bus, uh, Event Grid, Event Hubs, and uh, API management is kind of a core component to that. So adding in uh, OData support opens up the opportunity to integrate and service uh, existing OData endpoints that you might have. Um, so potentially you have, say, um, SAP point in your environment, you don't want to expose the SAP API out into the outside world, or you want to only uh, expose a small portion of it. Uh, that OData API support now opens that up as an opportunity for two. So we've already had this year uh, GraphQL support added um, to API management. So I think we're kind of at the point where you know, we can do SOAP, we can do REST, we can do uh, GraphQL, we can do OData. Um, so we've kind of got all of the kind of leading ways of doing the RPC. GRPC, um, we can do GRPC through uh, app service, but not through, I don't think, yeah, through API management. Yeah, I think there's web, there's definitely web books. I think I've got web books to put in there as well. Um, but yeah, API management is kind of one of those overlooked children in Azure often, um, but it does perform a pretty important role, particularly if you're doing a lot of integration. So those top three are all in preview, so that means you can go and try them out today, uh, but they typically don't come with an SLA uh, or a guarantee that they won't change between now and when they launch, but certainly worth having a look. Uh, globally, sorry, generally available. Um, so durable functions is an interesting extension to Azure Functions, and it adds the ability to do long-running uh, workflows on top of the Azure Functions runtime. So typically, Azure Functions can run for anything up to sort of 30 minutes uh, on the managed uh, consumption style plans between five to 30 minutes. If you want to do sort of longer running, multi-hour, multi-day, multi-month, I don't think you can do multi-year, um, but you can certainly do long-running workflows. Or you want to do stuff like send out a message and wait for a response to come back at some later point, possibly from a human. Durable Functions adds that ability on top of uh, the Azure Functions runtime, so you can do that programmatically. So if you're familiar with AWS, it would be something like Step Functions uh, in AWS. Uh, traditionally, you had uh, .NET support for Durable Functions extensions, but you now can do it in Java uh, and Python. It's using a new program which is the uh, V2 programming model that uh, Microsoft launched um, with Python. And I'm sure you all saw the use of uh, Python in Excel as well. It's not really this user group, but um, you now run Python in your Excel workbooks if you want. Um, it's mainly in preview in Windows, uh, sorry, Office Insiders built at the moment, but you don't need to install Python down on your local machine. Uh, you can write Python inside Excel inside of Excel and it will execute in a cloud environment which runs in Azure container instances, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then send a result back to your to your spreadsheet. VBA. So you don't need to write VBA anymore. No, Stephen, you can let go of that VBA 1990, yeah. 1990s call and wants their VBA back. Or in um, but yeah, Python. So um, uh, uh, I'm gonna say we can say Guido Van Rossel, but I think it's Guido. Uh, who is one of the, if not the founder of the Python program, and which is a distinguished engineer at Microsoft, and has been for the last three years and just spent um, the last couple of years working on adding this capability to Excel, which I know will make data scientists very happy to no longer have to write uh, Excel macros with their stuff. And you can do lots of neat stuff. You can do um, graphing and um, uh, NumPy and all that sort of stuff right inside of Excel. So you don't even need to export your data out of Excel and use the security tool right there. Oh well, security always freaks out. You know, you know, security's been putting the knowing technology since 1973, right? So um, they're not they're not always the funnest people to be around. Right. Uh, Azure load testing, uh, moving right along. Um, you can now run your tests for up to 24 hours at a time, so that's extended from where it used to be. You can do it all uh, through the Azure CLI, so no longer needing to do click ops in the portal. And you can run 100,000 concurrent users as part of your test, so uh, really starting to ramp that up and scale it out, uh, doing some work with that. It's a pretty neat feature. Uh, and then Azure, Azure Traffic Manager. Um, so if you've used Traffic Manager before, uh, health checks will have been the bane of your life uh, with Traffic Manager. So when you configure back-end services to sit behind uh, Traffic Manager, you would say, okay, this is my back-end service, and this is how to tell if it's healthy or not. Uh, and the number of times I would deploy it uh, something and then I would go, oh, it's not rousing any traffic, and you would find out it's because it thinks the back end service is unhealthy. Uh, with this new feature, you can kind of say, well, A, first of all, ignore the health check because I just know this thing's going to be there, so just send traffic to it. Or B, 
uh, configure a third-party health check for this service. So maybe you have some other way of determining whether that endpoint is healthy or not. You can now tra tell traffic managers to go and call that service or use that service to determine the health of the endpoint that you want to route the traffic to. Uh, and you're no longer tied to just having a single backend, very, sim very simplistic home model that you had uh, up until now. And traffic manager gets used uh, quite heavily um, in a lot of different places uh, in the Microsoft world as well. All right. So that's kind of all the news. Oh, and the Microsoft events are not coming up. Um, oh, are they up? There we are. You want that in? Okay, well, there you go. So this is a, I didn't know this slide was in the slide deck, but now I do. Um, so apparently Microsoft Ignite is coming up. Yep, jazz hands. The jazz hands out there. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, back in person. It's in November. Well, Build was in person this year as well. I think it was a bit of a last minute rush to, to stand up Build as an in person event. Um, I think some of that's because um, online events just don't get cut through uh, that in person events do. Um, so, yeah, if you're interested, uh, Seattle, I guess you can probably get tickets now or soon, so if you want. Um, and online, um, Online's always a bit of an interesting one because you can usually watch most of the sessions after they've been uh, delivered. The benefit of online is you can also download the slide decks and oftentimes the transcription of the, of the sessions. Not always, it depends on who's doing the session and what they're talking about. Um, but um, they were definitely helpful for me um, when I was at Microsoft to find out what was going on. So the link is not for registration. Registration is not open, but we can get notified once it's open. So. Register for notification. Yeah, just uh, yeah. and there's also a free day. There's a free day. Yeah, is it? They're doing a free day. Okay, they're doing a free day, so you've got yet another reason not to travel. To, I mean, to travel to Seattle um, for that. So they're doing it in Seattle rather than anywhere else. Um, all right, folks. So that's kind of it for now. No fix yet. Don't know where they've gone. Uh, they're doing a very bad job. Ah, uh, okay. It's one of those evenings. Um, all right. What can we do? Um, we might just stop there for a minute and I know just quickly before we do have a break, um, oftentimes, you know, we've talked for probably too long, but probably about uh, 40 minutes, maybe a little bit less. So just give you a feel, this is the dump of stuff since our last get together. So this is how we do the magic. I've got an Azure function that just goes and grabs uh, all the updates and stuffs them into a PowerPoint uh, in this format. So. Um, preview, we've got one, two, three, four, five. So there's five items on each of these. So we've got so we've got 35, 36, 37 preview items in the last six weeks, and there's GA. So they got 50. 51, 52. Unfortunately, my, my logic's bit broken, so it's stuff for time and stuff into the GA. So we've got 52 GA items as well. So, you know, and that's the stuff that's on the update block because um, there's plenty of other things that get put out yeah, through other, other channels. So we try to do a fairly good job of keeping it easily digestible uh, without uh, you all having to put up with too much of uh, the three of us before we get to the good stuff. Um, but as we've got no picks, so we might just take a quick quick break um, and hopefully the will show up over at a break. Uh, if not, we'll get Marty up to start after sort of the next five minutes or so. Uh, and then if and when Pete shows up, we might just have a quick break if that's okay with you, Marty, because he is coming and I know um, everyone looks ravenous. Absolutely. So let's take a quick five minute break. Um, thanks a lot, everybody. Five minutes. Five minutes? All right. Well, okay. Fingers crossed. Don't be shy. Feel free to stand up and have a chat. Uh, you can make a plug. Alistair would like to make a plug. What would you like to plug, Alistair? It's a new TDD group. Okay. And Melbourne. Okay. And we just had the first meeting up with us. Okay. Everyone was last night. So I highly recommend you. So DDD is domain driven design? Yeah, yeah. All right. I'm a huge DDD fan. Let's see. Where's my mouse gone? How's this set up? <laughs> there we go. No. Yes. There we go. So it's on Meetup. Yeah. It's on Meetup. Okay.
So is it Domain Driven Design Australia? Yeah. All right, can you tell me if this is the right one or not? Yep. So if you want to, if you're interested in going along to that, Domain Driven Design Australia. Um, what is Domain Driven Design? I should make a plug. All right, go for it. All Microsoft products are built with DVD. There we are. There you go. So, so <laughs> Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Oh, pizzas are here. Perfect yeah. timing. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Grab some pizzas because there's plenty yeah, on there. guys. I got a bit late tonight. But it's you need to do better, Sam. You need to do better. Yeah, you need I to mean, do better. <laughs> I did my job. All right. Grab some pizza, folks, while it's warm at the back. I'm and 100% sure when they opened the show, it was the first order. Um, eagerly if I send the link for Express Live vouchers to the new so I think it's ready to set up. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, you can open here and then yeah, share it here or easier yeah. just to send it and give me an awesome link. Sure. All right. Excited for pizza? I encourage you to listen here. Um, so we just want to put out that we've got a 20% discount for Express Live. Um, that will send a link to the meetup. Uh, but make sure everyone come along. It's 20% off. Very cool. That's a good. That's a really good deal if you want to attend. Definitely, definitely get there right now.
that's that's much this USB connected to this system. Anything from Matty's system is not coming properly. There we are. Oh yeah. So can you also see? Okay, can I stop sharing and I? Because I need to share the entire screen. I'm sharing the window now. So I stop now. So you can minimize the browser. Oh. All right, let's go. Okay, hello. I'm Marty. I'm from um, I think the topic for tonight is talking about another approach to go cloud native and beautiful cloud native. Um, and also, we wanted to talk about the view on multi cloud and how can we can make it happen in a different way. Um, the idea for us came about when we did a few transformations for some larger corporates. Um, and then we uh, thought about how much time, money, and resources these companies need to put in the transformation to make it happen. And the problem is worse when the, 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 the organization is larger. More teams, more people to approve from, more red tape, more assets to take care of. Um, and then we're talking about the new build to go cloud native, and we're talking about transforming the existing assets. So when you transform, uh, it's even more complicated because it's not only the new build that you have to take care of, it's the existing customer experience and the people who are using the, the old product. And you wanna make that transition from the old to the new, and you're gonna make it while the transition is smooth. But to make that happen, you wanna pour in a lot of engineering to make that transition happen. So in 2019, I thought maybe there is a way to simplify this and we started to build this platform, this product. Um, and today we are with 40 companies that they are building with us. We are in conversation with an Australian bank, one major retailer, and one large consultancy to deploy this platform for their clients. So that's the progress that we've made. If I wanted to say, to, to talk about what Pederex is, is a no ops platform as a service that would enable teams to um, build cloud native at scale, for a scale, velocity in minutes. That's what we've done. And um, talking about the scope of the functionalities that we provide, I categorized it into five buckets, application layer, DevOps, infra, runtime, and platform operations. So everything that you see here, we provision within a couple of minutes, and your API is up and running, and you're ready to build on top of it. We provision environments, three environments, staging, production, QA. Uh, managed identity we provide, so to protect your APIs, you don't have to build your identity yourself. Managed DevOps, the entire CI, CD pipelines, artifactory integration, it's all um, automated out of the box. You don't have to do anything. It's provisioned. Um, deployment gates for higher environments, staging and production. We provide protection if you need manual approval from specific people. Uh, monitoring and rate limiting if you need to, uh, to apply. Quota management on top of your APIs. That's already sorted out of the box. Um, conflict management and secret management, Sam mentioned, using key vaults. Uh, and we integrate with Azure, Azure Key Vault. Two capabilities that we, we have launched recently that we're going to announce it today. One is the concept of micro VBs. And the problem that all of these large entities have had with this monolithic database, that a lot of them stop at transforming the application layer because the data is too hard, too interconnected. I can't transform it, they just stop there. So we have introduced micro DBs, relational databases that we provision for each API per environment, so one API gets three databases in each environment. And then in, in light of the recent developments in AI, we have just launched our GPU support capability um, out of the box. We could automate um, the GPU provisioning as well, but because GPU is expensive, we just made it a manual process, and all you need to do 
is to apply six or seven lines of code, and the next deployment, your API will switch to GPU. You don't need to do anything. Um, all of it is running on AKS on Azure. The work on AWS has already started. And whilst we are provisioning the entire asset with one click, we are in a few months' time, we'll have the switch from the cloud provider to the other cloud provider happen with the click on the button as well. But before I get into a demo and I show you um, how it's done, I think I think there is a need for a, for the why. I need to explain why why we made such a move. Um, we we help teams of any size to uh, go through their planning experience, from a solo founder to a large enterprise like a bank. Uh, we've built it for a scale, and we've built it for enterprise patterns. I come from corporate background, and I know the red tapes. I know how hard it is to build something like that. Um, I categorize the needs of these this range into two groups, the smaller entities and large entities. When you talk about smaller entities, I'm going to exclude the solo founder, the, um, the company who's just building a prototype, they want to get a product out there, they want to raise money and then build it properly. That's when we come in. You probably wouldn't be able to help a solo founder because their focus is not a scale. Therefore, this is not common patterns. Therefore, it's just a good something. So, if I wanted to quickly talk about the problems or the functions that the smaller entities need to build in order to be cloud, in order to be cloud native, um, what's important to them? Number one, velocity and time to market. I just want to get to the market quite fast, um, and that means because I don't have a lot of money, then I need to build something quick and dirty. Building something quick and dirty means when the number of my customers grow, then my backend is on a scale we cannot be this scale. We were working with a company, they had, after eight years, and this is painful, after eight years they had a product with an awesome UI UX experience. But, and they had a couple of hundred clients, but I couldn't onboard any more clients because every new client that they onboard, they break the entire platform for the existing customers. And that's painful, these are not the only one you can't scale. And then, um, in that situation, you might have um, options of, do I rebuild, do I spend time and money and fix it? Would I be able to fix it? And then, um, a lot of people underestimate how complex rebuild is, the experience of the old and the new, and transition of the new the existing clients to the new is hard, it's work. So if that's the smaller entities, the larger entities, they, um, we had company budget problem for this small company, but for a bigger company, for a bigger corporate, we have budget, project, budget problem. Because if PM comes in, they just want to develop something, deliver something. And if you ask them, hey, I want to contribute to that core capability in the corner, I want to make it better, they are just like, put them in the tank, this, and we do it better. And that way it never comes. Um, or, you're concerned with policy, control, safety, governance. You have 100 scrum teams distributed in five different locations. Talking about engineering standards is easy, but how do you make sure it gets applied on a day-to-day -day basis that you know, engineers follow it? And then the speed of development suffers, security suffers, time to market suffers, because nobody is there to just build it. And if you manage to get all the approvals to just build it, it takes ages. Uh, you need to go through um, a lot of change management and approval process and that sort of thing to just start doing it. So if that was the business why we started building a, uh, a platform like this, now let's talk about if we managed to get approval to just build something like that. I'm going to go through quickly um, over what we need to tick to have such a platform. So again, application layer, I'm going to, I need to take care of API version, documentation, copy management, secret management, integration, database migrations, you need to work and connect to my database, logging and monitoring, identity policies, unit integration testing, integration with identity authority, acceptance testing, monitoring, and that's the big list. It takes a lot of time to build this. You talk about DevOps, and the DevOps you have to Agree on the branching model, but you have to make sure it applies across 4,000 repositories that we have. 
but you have a P2 and someone opens a repository and they want to patch it, you don't want to guess the branch that is already in production. You want to have it consistent across the platform. Branch permissions, policies, pipeline codifications, CI/CD pipelines, manufacturing integration, speed setup, and handwriterization, agreement on the base image, what should be the base image, release management, change management, um, integration with DevOps, test integrations, deployment approvals, uh, and default code reviewers. If you wanted to apply all of these on 4,000 repositories, that's that's cool. And then you talk about infrastructure, and for infra, I put them into two buckets. One is core services, identity payment messaging, that your APIs need to consume in order to function. And then there is infra, infra, like RMAC across your environments, health charts deployments, conflict management, uh, secret management at the cluster level, uh, and certificate management. All of these items, these are tiny items, but each of them, if you want to tick them, is like weeks of work in corporate. And then you talk about runtime, you've got to get a case for load balancing, proxy, quota management, CPU, GPU, and platform operation. You want to talk about um, compliance and consistency across the platform. A lot of times, you want your developers to be creative. But when it comes to compliance, you don't want people to be creative. You just want to apply it, you just want to force it. How do you make sure it does work? So if this was the background, if this was the background about uh -oh. why and what needs to be done, now I'm going to show you the alternative that we've done, and we take care of all that stuff in just a couple of steps. Uh, when you want to provision a new API in this way, the first thing that you choose is what is my stack. Right now we support three stacks, Node.js, Python.net, we release .net. Uh, in a couple of weeks time we release Python and Node, and every new stack is going to take us a few weeks, three weeks, four weeks to basically build that um, scaffold. Um, and it's easy for us because it's all containers, we don't care what it is, we just deploy it. So you choose your you choose your stack, you give um, your API a name and a unique name that is going to be used in many places like either URL, um, how you want to call it, database names, we will, we will use that name as a unique name. And then the next step is, this is where all the magic happens and we provision the entire environment with all those capabilities in just one click. So what we do here, we provision uh, your Azure DevOps space. We give all the development goals, we send emails to your team members. Uh, we uh, apply permissions to your space. Uh, we create three key vaults per API, and we attach it to it, to the API. One key vault per environment. And again, because we wanted this solution to work in many environments, in many settings, then we decided, okay, we want to have the highest level of isolation for every key vault. So if one API, one key vault are compromised, the rest of the APIs wouldn't be impacted. And the, the other thing that we do is we... Um, push one secret to each key vault and we integrate that secret to your repository as a sample, as a pattern, that if you wanted to introduce more secrets, you just follow the pattern. Uh, you don't have to do all the integrations. Then we create a repository for you uh, with a scaffold that I'm going to go through. Um, we create your CI pipeline, it's codified, CD pipeline, codified again, um, and we apply repository permissions repository policies, branch policies, branch protection, um, and at the end we add uh, one route, and at the end we add one route uh, to our proxy, our reverse proxy system, so your APIs would be reachable from outside world. So this is the gist of it. You get one repository, and you get your API route, which would be customized to your own domain in as well. And in a couple of minutes, this API is usable and you can basically call the testing points. So, uh, 
Uh, you might ask, what is the difference between this solution and something like Roku? What we have focused on is main portability. If you wanted to go from AWS to, to Azure, from Azure to on-prem, we enabled you to do that because we offer run containers. And the, uh, the primary concern for us was to cater for enterprise, and enterprise with a lot of regulatory requirements, they need portability. So if that was the provisioning process, uh, now let's cover how we have structured our APIs on the cluster. So what we have done is we, we are using from, uh, starting from the bottom, and I go up, and how to cover an organization with this model. Uh, we're using when it's namespaces, each API gets uh, three namespaces for each environment. Uh, with dedicated database and key vault. Um, and then if you have many APIs, then you basically repeat. And this whole structure, we call this structure an app space. And you can map an app space into a department, into a platform. If you are in the context of a bank, mobile banking will get one app space, internet banking will get one app space, branch, and so forth. And one of the reasons that we've structured this way is we wanted all the APIs in production to be able to talk to each other. So all the APIs um, can communicate to um, APIs in the same space, but not to the other environment. And now this is a 5,000 feet view of an organization that this is one app space, one app space, one app space, and this is how we cover uh, an entire organization with platforms. And this is a traffic view. Um, so typically you would put the load balance on top of your ecosystem, one APIM in front of it if you wanted your customers to have a consistent routing experience if you change their APIs. A reverse proxy is responsible for uh, routing the traffic to all the different platform, and then the rest of it would be uh, engineers ingress and the Kubernetes really services for that. So now, if because um, the entire process takes a couple of minutes, I'm going to go to dashboard now. And when you log into your dashboard, this is what you see. This is one of those app spaces that I talked about. So, for example, when I go to mobile banking, I can see. I can see all the APIs that I've provisioned. And this is this is one pane of glass that you can manage everything related to your API, all the concerns that you might have. You talk about the API, code, CI pipeline, CD pipeline, secrets, database, GPU, infra monitoring, API monitoring, and user monitoring. That's all you need to manage your API. And um, so these are these are your routes, as we talked about. This is how you can call your API right now, and it's protected using our identity API, which you can get a job token and call them. And then when you talk about code base, this is the concept of a scaffold that I was talking about. And the scaffold comes with a typical three-layer, three four-layer architecture. Then you have the API, business layer, data layer, and infrastructure. And this gives you a head start that to start your development without worrying about a lot of common concerns that your APIs might have. Uh, and I'm talking about, for example, if I could, uh, setting up the configuration, setting up policies like horse policy, auto mapping, dependency injection, response compression, health checks, response caching, versioning, documentation. This is not probably, when you build a product, this is not probably what you want to care about. You want to care about your product, not these basic um, concepts. But Simon the other day was telling me you probably need to include one simple scaffold that is empty. People may want not want this structure or want to start with something simple. And that's how to do this if you want to release that soon. But one folder that we are that we need that to be here is basically your infrastructure settings. So you have 
all the health charts that have been generated for you. You have the secret drivers to connect to the Kubernetes, um, uh, using Kubernetes managed identity to, go to talk to the key vaults. So these are, uh, this folder here, this is the only thing that needs, needs to be part of your repository. And that's all we care about. The rest of it is uh, abstracted. If I go back to my build pipeline, for example, you can see history of your builds. You can have a look at it uh, for troubleshooting if, if it has failed. Um, and you can schedule a new build if you wanted to trigger a new build. Um, release pipeline is the same. So this shows that I have deployed to all three environments. And if I wanted to talk about uh, one API, so this is an API that hasn't been deployed. And we can automate any of these steps. Um, for example, QA could be automated by a stage of production by either Google. And then this is the um, this is the view that you can manage all the contents of your key vault for three environments for these secrets: um, adding secrets, removing secrets, modifying secret value. Whatever you want to do, you can do it throughout here, and we directly manage your key vaults behind the scenes. Database, we, um, we generate, as I said, one database per environment. And um, because this database generation just takes a couple of minutes to be done, and I've done it for you. But when it's done, we automatically push the, uh, the connection string for that database into your, into your key vault. So this is what you can inject to your application and to your database, run your migration, and it's all done for you. And the last one is um, the GPU compute structure that I talked about, that all you need to do to switch from CPU to GPU is to go to that infrastructure folder in the repository and have these six or seven lines. And that switches your compute to GPU. Um, infra monitoring. This is another level that um, I've talked about that you basically have all the concerns of your API covered in one pane of glass. And this is your view around your infrastructure. So you have your pipeline and code and API, and this is how your containers are functioning on your queue cluster. Um, you can monitor the usage. If you have multiple containers, you can monitor the health. You can see what's happening inside each container that locks. And at the end, you would have um, the, the monitoring part of it, the uh, filtering through the uh, transactions uh, and all the traffic that you have had in there, uh, whatever time frame that you are interested in. So this is probably the scope of functions that we provide. Uh, I'm going to talk about what comes next. We have a long uh, wish list from our customers, what to do, what, what to build next. But I'm going to start here, of course, here. Thoughts, comments, concerns, feedback. Um, Sorry? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Like so that's another option. Like we can we can spin up a service function as part of it as well. So if um, we provided exactly a single function on service, would you use it? OK, we feel that. My question is around the data layer. So you've got uh, provisioning a new database per environment per API. Um, are there plans in the future, like how would incorporating like a per tenant, like a multi tenant app, uh, where you have a different database per tenant um, in each environment, how would you sort of handle that with, uh, with this approach? Uh, are you saying that you would be having? One database per multiple APIs? 
Uh, so it's multi-tenant application layer, and then each tenant that's using the application, um, they have their own database in like production. Like each client will have their own dedicated database. Ah, um, uh, so yeah. you okay? So you're provisioning the service on behalf of your clients, and you want it to be multi-tenant. Yes. We can do that with the DZ. Right. So how would you uh, so the, the, the experience that you saw, how would you want how would you like it to be if you wanted to enable that? Well I'm wondering if like um in the sign up like you use a sign up flow, if there would be like an API that you could expose where you could sort of um put in like uh, basic configuration and then like provision the database but then also put into the system where um, you know the manage, like the sequence managing key and all that sort of stuff. Like I'm not sure about all the other tooling you have behind the scenes, but like how would you manage dynamically changing the amount of databases per requirement per API? Like, that's that's pretty easy for us because everything that you see here, they are all APIs yeah. and I can call um, all I need to do is to just say, this is the API, I need multiple databases for it. I just need to provide a name and it provisions the database. It's pretty easy for me to do. Yeah, and I'm just seeing these days, like after actually setting up everything and provisioning it, being able to like then call like an endpoint and like, you know, as users are signing up, create more databases and then manage. Uh, I've been seeing the management of like um, uh, restoring the databases and stuff like that. Like, Managing all that as well as a pain. So, yeah, but it would work in your case because it's a it's not to that itself. So, you'd be, but the way you would fix the back line would be to do that now. Each is set up for you, but for each, each, each of the individual clients. So, that would be, I mean, and then you give them some cost discount or something, and then maybe that happens. So, you know, basically, what you see the same in your. There certainly has to put more tenancy applications and support more tenancy. Yeah, so we've got to put the framework by using it. Has a, it can, every query has a key. It's on the key for each tenant. Yes. So it knows exactly who you're talking to. So, you know, it's a problem with that. It's not that it's all. But they don't know for you. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So, so essentially, to get to that use case that I mentioned, of have like a different database per yes. as a whole to a tenant. Um, you essentially do what you just did then, like set up the entire application and its own environments. Uh, like you could in the application space. So App space. Yeah. yeah. You do you provision that from scratch for every new client. Yes. Is that how you sort of yeah. facilitate that scenario? So each um, each app space, um, when you sign up for a service, we give you an app space. Each app space has three environments and then deploy the unlimited number of APIs into that app space. Yeah, but this is for different clients, so that's yeah. a lot of tendency. So I'm saying that you have your system for each client, and then you know, you know get a discount because you've got 10 of them. So, you know, you find some other that's using your framework, and it's a copy for each client. Right, you know, but you know, as long as the price is right. Sure. If I, um, if you had an API, um, the logic for multi tenants would you be I can I give you 10 databases yeah. and you have one API? Yeah. Would you be comfortable to manage all the logic for routing the traffic to these databases itself? Yeah. That's what the scrum does. So that's what I'm saying. It's a way to get that framework. So this is, for example, an API that doesn't have a database. And we didn't provision the database as part of that provisioning process because databases cost us money and it's expensive, more expensive money. And we put that one in there. So what we do here, when we press that button, it um, generates the databases one by one for you. If I put a text box here, 
that how many databases you want for this API. And when you do that attribution like that, those are the databases that are gone. Yeah, that'd be, that'd probably would, uh, yeah, uh, um, I guess some of the factors, but yeah, probably would just like that. So, uh, this case, I guess. And then what happens is once it's provisioned, I publish 10 connection strings to the keyboard and you go and check it out. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would probably. So if that capability is there, is it true? Or yeah, like it's there. Absolutely. I call an API, I give it a name. Yeah. This is the product generated database for it. That's all. And the reason I said so when we when we um, when we are developing AWS shard of all these functions, we only redevelop 10%, 15% of our ecosystem. We built an identity ourselves because we wanted to have the freedom to move anywhere. And uh, we have total freedom to do whatever we want. Only 10%, 15% of our system is based on the function that we see as so for AWS, it's a very small portion. Uh, going back to your point, if provisioning one database, n number of databases per uh, API, it's as easy as just making it more, that's all. Okay, great. Anything else? Any other comments? Yeah, how did you manage communication between the subdivisions? Is there no communication? Sorry, you could actually get both different subdivisions and APIs and different subdivisions that they don't communicate. What about that when you need to do that? Uh, so, communication, are you talking about between environments? Yeah. Staging and production? No, no, we didn't make that. We didn't decide within the airspace. Uh, so, uh, when there is a need, we can definitely give you uh, a reference to one API deployed to one specific app space. Surely, in a bank, for example, you have these different departments that they would be using one API, core API. So we give you a reference to that API deployed in app space X, and all you need to do is in your configuration file, call that API, and instead of HTTP, blah, blah, call that API using that reference. And we make it direct call. So that's how we imagine you would enable us as well. Sorry? Oh, we've been big on um, Kafka. Um, so if you want uh, a question for you, would you would you like to see us exposing cues to you so you can define your topics, you can put messages there? Would you like to see it as one thing within here? Well, I'm not a fan of That was a trick question then. <laughs> Care where the topic comes from? Yeah, so anything else? Comments? Yeah. 
Open the language. The only language infrastructure is completely hide from the customer and user. So if they want to do some sort of like customization, they don't need so for next slide, I'm going to talk about deep, um, deployment modes. And if you are an enterprise customer and you run this ecosystem in your enterprise, then you would have access to everything. The reason that we have hidden some of the details is because I don't want to expose my connection to my cluster, to my managed client. I don't want to have any, um, any connectivity there. So if you are an enterprise customer and you go to your repository, you can see uh, you can see your pipelines, you can customize them, you can push changes to it. It's all yours. But if you are running your work on my environment, on the managed mode, on pedrix.com, then I'm hiding all the complexity and your dashboard is your go-to uh, go facility. Yeah. So in the enterprise, like the uh, SQ, Oh, they do have it. If they wanted to go deep and they do wanted to do customization, they can also do that. And from the point they came to the customization, you stop the support, for example, for the upcoming version and upgrade because it adds a complexity of the change dates. So how you how you handle the change dates if they do be heavily customizing the environment and it just stops you from the I think um, our thought process has been um, for a good client, we are happy to do whatever. Um, we are happy to manage different versions if uh, they want to go big on our platform. And we are happy to maintain different versions. Uh, we've decided not to um, provide access to our code. But we don't sell code, we sell the service only. Um, some parts of our system, it's a wrapper on top of the existing ecosystem like Azure DevOps, but a big part of it is like proxying, like routing, like live traffic. It's closed. It's managed through our system. So there are different parts. We can we can talk about what is the change, what do you want? Are we happy to maintain a new version? I think it's all open for conversation. At the enterprise level, for example, if they want to you build something with this and use it for integration with the existing system, for example, in another cloud, on prem or in the other center. So I'm trying to get to that point. They need a, like a hybrid connectivity, they need express route, they need VPN, all those connectivity that they need for these APIs to work properly with the, for example, backend. DB somewhere else, existing DB somewhere else. So at that, so you leave that to the customer. They manage all the connectivity, everything, and how how they can fire up all those things with these. Okay. So I divide your question into two parts. One is infra services like the AKS, like the VNets, like whatever you want to do at the infra level. When we run this system on your enterprise, sky is your limit. Do whatever you want on your infrastructure. If it needs the change on the application, on our platform as a service, we're happy to make it. If if that goes to the original product, we are more than happy to work with you, co-build with you, uh, and make it happen in the original line of product. If, uh, if not, we're happy to make a version, work with you again, but maintain a different version for you. Then um, the second part of the question was, what if I wanted to use, what if I didn't want to use a SQL server? What if I wanted to use it? The reason that we exposed secret management was secret management was the key to any integration. And the moment that you have secret management, you can integrate to any service and you have access to your code, to your repository. So if this is not a low code and no code platform, you have access to your repository, you can manage secrets, integrate with whoever you want. So I think that's the part that we provide maximum level of flexibility to the developer when it comes down to compliance, branch permissions, CI, CD, the codification. We try to be a little bit more strict because it's compliance and organization. Any thoughts? Okay. So going back to my 
slides. Uh, this is the modes of deployment that uh, we talked about. One is not dependent on we have right now enterprise and deployment on the whole side. But there is a middle ground that you might need your dedicated identity. You didn't want to share with anyone. And you wanted to have a, an instance of this platform as a service, but run on our infrastructure. We also do that. That's we call it single tenant public like duplication. We, we support multiple single tenants. Um, and that's another word we call it infrastructure hours, your instance. Um, where are we going in future? We have two branches. One is Agility Multi Cloud, which we release in a few months' time, um, and also Health. We have a big list of wish lists for health checks. Uh, we have a lot of health checks right now. We just need to expose them. Gen um, AI, that's big for us as well. Like a concept of automated pull requests, improvements, bugs, integration with security patching. Hey, there's a vulnerability in this package in that version. You scan all the code in our organization, uh, all the tenants. And if you find that package, we just raise a pull request and you see it's approved and go and gets reported in the market. And that's pretty much the scope that we are trying to combine um, AI and the cloud. Um, we tried, right at this stage, we have thought about uh, not getting involved in code generation like at the ID level, it's not our expertise. We are a platform as a service, we try to provide an infrastructure. And that's pretty much the um, um, what we have, what we have done. This um, I didn't expect this platform to take this much time. Um, I used to be a happier person. <laughs> I used to smile more. Uh, but it's been two and a half years, three years that we've been spending time on this. And uh, signs of some market demand are coming, and it's fun. Thanks for your attention. I think I'm keen to talk to you about it. Yeah, that's what I always say. I'm going to say that there is computer involved. Really quick. Yeah. Um, look, uh, thanks a lot, everybody. Um, if you want to hang around, have a chat with Marty. Great presentation. Um, I met him um, probably five or six months ago. Um, Really interesting to see someone taking a passion project and pushing it this far and building, building using a lot of tools that under the covers a lot of us are very familiar with, but um, making it quite consumable, which is awesome. Um, we will be back in early October for the next meetup. Uh, we don't have the details up online yet, but they will be up soon. Uh, we will send everyone in this room and other folks uh, the point off from the expert live folks uh, for uh, early bird tickets, if we can still call them that. So, we'll call them other bit tickets. The, 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 the running off doesn't really matter. If you want to go, you'll go. So, and maybe you can you know, shout some of your friends, tell them to come along to the expert slide. Um, yeah, come, come and grab Sam or me if you want an email address to present at a future meetup. Otherwise, that's it for this month, folks. We'll see you at the next one in October. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.